actually, uh, I decided to change a little bit uh, uh, the subject of my talk uh, to match better uh, uh, what um, Thierry was explaining uh, this morning. Also, because uh, uh, what I'm going to talk now is, I think, is one of uh, it's, it's very exciting in the uh, in this field of uh, non-equilibrium statistical physics. As it's also simpler than the the super technical KPC stuff. So for uh, for students that uh, are, have come, maybe have come here to to see the talk, uh, I hope it's going to be a a, a better choice. So um, what I'm going to talk today it's uh, so it's about uh, is a non equilibrium fluctuations of a one dimensional uh, particle systems. So this uh, what I'm going to talk today is a part of the PhD thesis of my uh, PhD student Octavio Menezes from IMPA and, um, and I'm going to define a very simple model on which we already have this uh, a feature about the non-equilibrium fluctuations uh, about non-equilibrium no? it's, 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 a, it's a system which is very simple but doesn't have uh, explicit uh, invariant measures uh, in the sense of uh, Markov chains and uh, it's a, it's a, it's a non-reversible system um, on which these uh, features about uh, how to uh, deal with uh, thermodynamics and, uh, uh, and, and fluctuations and, uh, and, and these kind of questions uh, are also present. So maybe it's not the most natural model but it's the simplest one on which we can already see uh, what is going on. Uh, so, just uh, to repeat a little bit uh, uh, the notation uh, of uh, Thierry and uh, maybe fix some other uh, different uh, ones. So, let us start uh, with uh, n is going to be natural number, is going to be the scale parameter of my system. So, I'm going to consider a family of Markov chains indexed by this uh, parameter n. So, let me call uh, lambda n the discrete circle with endpoints which we can identify with the set 1n uh, and let me call omega n the set of uh, uh, binary sequence of length n and from the notation it's more or less clear that I'm going to consider periodic boundary conditions on my system so uh, I'm I'm thinking about the circle of uh, endpoints, and uh, now in this uh, uh, finite state space, I'm going to define a Markov chain, okay? A continuous time Markov chain, which uh, by now should be more or less familiar to you. So let me first uh, draw uh, these uh, intervals. So now, uh, well, uh, maybe I draw crosses here. So I have particles going around this uh, discrete uh, lattice. Um, these particles will have uh, what we call, we follow what we call the simple exclusion dynamics. So um, they can jump uh, left and right. and uh, the this, this model will be uh, in continuous time, so the rate of jump is going to be n squared. Okay, so I'm already introducing this diffusive uh, uh, scaling um, Thierry was mentioning uh, uh, this morning. So uh, what happens here is that uh, uh, this particle tries to jump to the left uh, with an exponential rate n squared, which means that the time is so far the one of, uh, of an n squared. The same thing to the uh, to, to, to the other side independently for each particle and there is the exclusion rule that tells me that this jump here is forbidden. Okay, so this is what uh, we call the C 
symmetric, simple exclusion. Periodic. Periodic, yeah. So, uh, well, this is maybe some uh, a part of the interval. Um, and, and, and we consider periodic boundary conditions. And uh, on top of this, uh, of these dynamics, I'm going to do something else because as uh, Thierry was mentioning uh, this morning, this system here has nice uh, product invariant measures. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's reversible with respect to this invariant measure. So what is the non-reversible, non-equilibrium feature of the system? So uh, we have to do something with it. Uh, something we can do is to put these uh, reservoirs uh, with the different densities, uh, but uh, we can do it uh, also in a trans sort of translation in very way, uh, putting a creation and annihilation of particles. Okay, so to to this part of the dynamics, I'm going to add uh, an extra feature, which is the following. So. If a site X is uh, empty at some point, uh, at some time t, then with rate 1, we will create a particle there. Okay, so the model is no longer conservative. And uh, if the site X is occupied, then a particle will be destroyed with a rate which is 1 plus b times eta x minus 1, eta x plus 1. Okay, the exact form of this factor here is not very important uh, as long as it's different from zero, uh, and 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 it's, uh, it depends on the on the on the neighbors on the uh, of of my site X in some way. As a theory this morning, I'm going to call eta X the occupation number at site X of my Markov chain. So it's, this is equal to one if there is a particle at site x minus 1 equal to 0 if there is a hole there. And uh, you can check that this uh, part here destroys the invariance of the product measures. Uh, maybe as, a, as an Easter egg for people who may, might be interested in this, uh, you can check that uh, these rates here actually leave uh, invariant uh, the, um, the Gibbs measure of the IC model that Thierry uh, defined this, uh, this morning. That part, th that's not very important, but uh, the what is important is that the product measure that was the invariant measure for the exclusion process is no longer invariant because of this factor here. So this is going to be my uh, sequence of Markov chains parameterized by this uh, uh, scaling parameter n. Uh, as you can see here, this creation and annihilation part is not accelerating in time. So there is no factor n squared or n or something here. So this is, uh, happens as a, 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 at a rate which is slower in principle than the uh, rate of which particles jump from side to side. So in, in a sense, it, you can think about it as a perturbation, but it's not uh, it's not really a perturbation. It turns out that uh, these two parts of the dynamics, they are comparable in size. Okay, uh, in any meaningful uh, way, um, maybe comparing uh, eigenvalues or uh, or uh, some other uh, some other uh, statistics that you want to see in this model, you will see that uh, both uh, parts of the dynamics have a non-negligible effect of on, on any observable of the system. So uh, this is, this is the, the model. I'm going to call it uh, eta x t n. And uh, in a moment, I will start to drop the, the index n from the notation because it's going to be present everywhere, no? because everything depends on this parameter n. So this is uh, this is uh, my uh, Markov chain that uh, and I want to study. And um, it's uh, irreducible in this uh, finite state because now the number of particles is no longer uh, preserved, so it has an invariant measure. 
but this is by a measure is very complicated. I, I, as far as I understand, nobody, nobody really knows anything about it. Uh, you, you, we don't even have this kind of uh, better ansatz uh, framework or, or mapping to the... There might be some mapping to some uh, quantum uh, spin system, but in this case it's, meaningf uh, it's not really meaningful, uh, because it's not an, an, uh, uh, an integrable uh, quantum spin system. So, actually I, 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 uh, I'm coming from, the, from a point of view which is exactly the opposite of, uh, of, uh, of Malik, that's... Um, I, 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 I try to derive methods which are so, uh, uh, somehow robust on the uh, particular details of the dynamics. So uh, we want to do something which does not depend on the particularities of each model. Of course, the results we can get from, uh, uh, from that uh, point of view are much weaker than the, the results you can get from integrable uh, systems. But uh, the, the, the this is a complementary thing, because uh, you have this object, uh, this phenomenon, that you want to characterize. So you want to say from one side as much as you can about it, and from the other side you want to say that this phenomenon is as much uh, universal as you can. So we are working on the universal part, and uh, with integrable probability you are working on the fine description of the phenomenon. Uh, so this is my setup. We have a, uh, this Markov chain, and uh, we want to study this Markov chain, and uh, we want to hopefully to prove uh, something about uh, non-equilibrium fluctuations. Okay, so let me uh, do some definitions. So Cx plus is going to be this quantity here. So what are these uh, quantities here? Uh, These are the rates uh, um, at which particles are created and annihilated by the dynamics. So this is the rate at which particles are created. So this is the rate I wrote there, but you also need to have a hole there at position x, so you have this extra factor here. And c minus the same thing, the rate is 1, but you need to have a particle to, to, to destroy it. Um, so this is the definition. Let me also call mu rho. Uh, it's going to be the product. Bernoulli measure uh, if you want explicit uh, formula is something of uh, this sort huh? and uh, as I already remarked this measure mu rho is not invariant under these dynamics but uh, in some sense, it should be close to invariant, maybe. Excuse me, I think you switched. Yeah, the switch and C minus right. and six plus and six minus switch probably. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I switched them, so I should correct one of them. Uh, so in my notes, I think uh, I, I made my notes like this. So probably it's better to correct them in this way. Thank you. And uh, yeah. So, another quantity which is meaningful for this model is uh, the function f of rho, which is uh, going to be the average uh, reaction uh, rate on the system. So, it's a uh, it's an number of particles that in average are created minus the number of particles that are destroyed in average with respect to this uh, if, you, if your system is uh, distributed with the Bernoulli product measure mu rho. So f of rho is going to be just the expectation of this guy minus the expectation of this guy with respect to mu rho. So it's uh, 1 plus b, uh, so it's 2 b rho, 1 minus rho minus rho. Um, a quick observation, uh, f of rho is equal to zero for rho equals to, so I write, 
I wrote down a formula which is totally irrelevant actually, but uh, sometimes people like uh, uh, formulas. Is that uh, f of rho is equal to zero for that ch particular choice of uh, the parameter rho. Actually, what is important is there is uh, some density, non-trivial density, for which f of rho is equal to zero. This is always true because uh, no matter what I put here and, 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 and here, uh, f of rho is going to be equal to 1 at 0 and minus 1 at uh, 1. So it's, uh, it's positive at 0, negative at, uh, at 1, so it has to be 0 somewhere in the middle. Maybe it, it might be 0 even multiple times. Uh, that actually, multiple uh, appearances of, uh, of zeros is, uh, might be interesting for uh, stability or things like that, but uh, uh, for the moment, uh, this is all that we need to know is that there is an invariant measure. So let me keep uh, going uh, with the uh, definition. So let me call Ft. It's going to be the density of the process, or so eta t of my Markov chain, with respect to mu of rho. So from now on, I'm going to fix rho, and rho is going to be always equal to this number here, for which f of rho is equal to zero. Okay? So that, that particular point is interesting in, uh, in, uh, from the point of view of non-equilibrium statistical uh, mechanics, because somehow the average uh, rate uh, of creation and annihilation is zero. So it means that at that particular point, probably, the effect of the, of the creation and annihilation is uh, smaller in the system. So you call Ft the density with respect to mu rho. I'm going to assume that the F0 is equal to 1. That is, uh, I'm going to start my system with the distribution mu rho, and I want to see whether the system stays there at later times or not. Okay, so I'm going to define now. a number h and t, which is just the relative entropy of my Markov chain at time t, with respect to this product measure mu rho. Okay? And, um, well, this talk is going to be a little more, more mathematical than the, the previous talks, so in particular I'm going to state a theorem. Should be density, you mean it's a function of, of x? Or? It's a function of eta. Okay, so it's a function in uh, omega, in omega n. And uh, so I'm going to state a theorem. So the theorem is the following: uh, for any time t positive, there exists a constant that depends on this time t, such that H n of t smaller than c for any time up to time big T and for any n. Okay, so this is the theorem. Uh, actually, this theorem is very useful. Um, it's telling you a lot of things about uh, your system. Uh, and I, I also it's very surprising because you see the, the, the omega n is a huge space, 2 to the n uh, elements. Entropy to be finite in such a huge space means that you're really close to this, uh, to, 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 to this uh, product uh, invariant measure we were talking at the beginning. So, Although the product measure is not invariant, it's very close to invariant. This is what this theorem is telling you. 
Moreover, let's say that uh, you take uh, any statistics of uh, your uh, configuration space um, for which uh, under this product measure you can prove uh, uh, convergence theorem, large large numbers, maybe central limit theorem. This uh, bound here is telling you that uh, it's not telling you that you can transport uh, this uh, convergence result to the to to our system, but it's telling you at least that uh, uh, the those statistics they do have a limit. It's not it's not necessarily the same, and it's actually not going to be the same. But uh, they do converge, so it's some sort of relative uh, compactness uh, theorem. Yeah. The local statistics should they be the same? The local ones. The local ones. Are, uh, it, it depends on uh, uh, on on, uh, on uh, whether your statistics depends on time or not, and whether your statistics are uh, are uh, increasing fast enough uh, with respect to the size. Just look at uh, I don't know finite size. Yeah, finite sizes won't be uh, the same, certainly. They won't be the same. Yeah, because uh, it's just a finite entropy. So you know that this, uh, the distribution is going to be uh, um, absolutely continuous mm -hmm. to the actual limit. Okay. In some cases, they, they, they're going to be the same because of uh, maybe translation invariance or other arguments. Uh, okay, so. But the point is that this is a very strong statement, okay? So now I will try to convince you why uh, such a statement should be uh, a, 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 at least reasonable. And uh, let me just mention some observation. Uh, I, I don't want to enter into the details of, uh, of this thing because it's, uh, it's, it's very technical and it's complicated and... Uh, uh, um, is, there is not an easy way to to formulate it, but uh, so the uh, this uh, family of processes has uh, uh, what is called the hydrodynamic limit, given by uh, the following equation. So this part here is not surprising because it's exactly the same as uh, in the simple uh, exclusion process. It's, this, it's what uh, Thierry described uh, before. And now you have a reaction term, which is f of u, which is also not uh, also very reasonable because it's just the, uh, the average uh, rate of uh, creation and annihilation. So what is going on usually in these hydrodynamic limits is that uh, Heuristically, the system is close to product in any finite but uh, large uh, box. So when n goes to infinity, if you, if you fix uh, a box of size, uh, I don't know, 100 or maybe log n, inside there, things look like a product measure. Therefore, when you look at, uh, at the density as a global object, uh, uh, there is averaging, and you get uh, that the density as a global object evolves with this uh, PD. And F is the function. F is the same function that is written there. So, of course, uh, and this result can be understood as a large large number, and of course there is a one particular solution of this equation which is interesting for us, which is that uh, uh, rho, so u xt constant equal rho is a stationary solution of, uh, of the hydrodynamic equation. Okay? So this fact that the rho is a stationary solution of the hydrodynamic equation hints you at the, the fact that uh, at least uh, in that scale n squared on which the hydrodynamic equation appears, the, this product measure shouldn't evolve too much. And uh, so, for this reason, you may, maybe you may expect so a, a result of this sort. 
Actually, this is something you can check. Let's say that uh, you want to change uh, the global density of, uh, of your uh, product when newly measured. Large deviations theory tells you how to do it. Uh, you have this exponential to the minus n uh, generator, etc. And uh, so the, the what is important is that n in the large deviation principle that tells you exactly that the entropy cost to change the density in a box of size, let's say, epsilon n, so something that should be observable, uh, 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 unobservable for the macroscopic system, is of order n. So you need at least uh, delta n entropy to change the density of your system. Uh, therefore, this, uh, this fact uh, that the rho is stationary uh, tells you that the entropy should be little o of n. And this is something that can be proved, that the entropy is little o of n um, in this case, and the, this is uh, actually is called uh, Yau's relative entropy method for hydrodynamic limits. And uh, it, it has been a, it's a, it's a well-developed uh, part of uh, the theory of uh, interacting particle systems, and usually that's what you can prove. So uh, entropy, you mean this entropy? Exactly. It's, it's more general because you can you actually compare. You can you know you don't need to start with a, a, a constant product measure. You can make it evolve in time. But uh, the, the the only thing that I want to Stress is that if you are satisfied with large large numbers, what you need to prove is that the entropy is of a little o of n. So at the level of large large number of uh, microscopic observables, uh, this is all that you need. On the other hand, once you have a large large number, a natural question is about large deviations or central limit theorems. Large deviations, it turns out that uh, it's a uh, it's a simpler problem than central limit theorems for, uh, well, for, for some reason. Uh, and um, you can check that if I give you a finite amount of entropy, I can actually change the CLT. Because for example, something I can do with this product measure is to change the density rho to rho plus 1 over square root of n. That is something that at each side produces entropy of order 1 over n. So if you sum over n sides, you get entropy of order 1. And now this uh, plus 1 over square root of n allows me to change the, the mean and also the variance of the Gaussian uh, random variable in the limit. So uh, at the level of, uh, if you want to prove something like central limit theorems, this is uh, actually the least uh, you need to prove. Uh, because if I give you finite entropy, I can change the, the variance in the CLT. Okay, so um, therefore, if you believe that uh, you can some sort of central limit theorem is true for uh, these kind of systems, then you can start to believe that this theorem might be true. And since uh, for these systems large deviation principles have been proved, you are uh, tempted to believe that the CLT is also true. No? Uh, so, so from the heuristic point of view, these results should be uh, reasonable. So, why? May I ask a naive question? Yeah, yeah, of course. I thought that you tried a large division principle and you just expanded it near the minimum. It you gave you the central limit theorem. Mm. At least for a physicist. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, actually, this is far from being true for, uh, for probabilists. It's um, something which is true is that if you are able to prove both, you can recover the variance. Uh, looking at the large deviation, uh, at, the, at the expansion around zero of the large deviation functional. This is true. So, 
taking the large deviations principle for this model and expanding around the, the equilibrium or, or uh, around uh, whatever point uh, you are interested in, you will obtain the, the, the variance of the, of, of the Gaussian process that should, you, you should obtain. And, uh, but uh, it's not true that, uh, the, uh, and it's actually much more difficult to prove uh, uh, central limit theorems in the context of interacting particle system than the large deviation principle. And the, and the reason is it related to this, some, somehow to this KPC business. Because the objects, the space-time processes that will appear are these nonlinear uh, stochastic partial differential equations, which are very uh, delicate and uh, difficult objects. Okay, so this is why actually CLT is more difficult than uh, large deviations. Um, actually, it's not naive because when you will learn probability, we learn the other way around that uh, large deviations is more difficult than uh, CLT. Um, so. And uh, this is what uh, I like a lot about uh, the, this, uh, the, the, this result here, is that uh, this is a general fact about Markov chains that uh, has been kind of uh, overlooked a little bit, but uh, everybody probably knows the following inequality. So let me just uh, write the following. So now I'm going to enter a little bit into the proof of this theorem. Okay, so uh, from here you can see that I, I'm really a mathematician because okay, well, who cares about proofs? Uh, but um, I think that this particular theorem has a very interesting proof. And we can learn something about the proof. This is what I like about proofs, that when you can learn something about the proof. It's not that the proof by itself is something interesting. And uh, so if you have a Markov chain and then you take uh, any reference measure and you compare the, the, the entropy of the law of your Markov chain with respect to, the, uh, with respect to this reference measure, you have the following uh, inequality. So you take the entropy. So, well, if you want to prove something like this, how do you proceed? Uh, the usual way that you do is, uh, okay, let's take the derivative and let's prove that the derivative is bounded. <laughs> okay, uh, this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> so, and, well, you take the derivative and you start to bound until you bound it by something constant. Uh, so, what you have here, and this is totally general, is that uh, the entropy, the derivative of the entropy is bounded by this expression here. So let me explain uh, what these guys are. So I, I will start with this guy here. This is what people call the Dirichlet form. In our case, it's not really the Dirichlet form because the, the measure mu rho is not, is not the invariant measure, uh, but it's still a, um, a positive uh, quadratic form. So. Where, uh, so d of a function h is the following. So it's n squared the sum over x of the integral of, so I hope the, the notation is not too complicated. Uh, it shouldn't be. So this gradient here is a discrete gradient that is, uh, is the difference uh, in the function h when I move a particle from x to x plus 1 or vice versa. Okay? So it's uh, the rate of change of h when I give one of the jumps of the exclusion part of the dynamics. And this thing here, the same but for the reaction part. Okay? So nabla h of x is how much the function h changes when I create a particle at x or I destroy a particle at x. Okay? So those are nice uh, quadratic uh, uh, forms. And um, this is turns, turns out to be what people call the Dirichlet form, but the, for the case on which b is equal to 0. 
okay? And uh, and now I have to explain what is L n star. So ln star is very easy, it's just the adjoint of the generator in L2 mu rho. So when this measure mu rho is invariant, the adjoint of the generator is the generator of a Markov chain. So when you apply it to the indicator function equals, uh, this is not, this is the constant function equals to one. So when you apply a Markov generator to a constant function, you get zero. So in the case on which mu rho is actually invariant, this term here is zero. This term is positive, and you recover something very <laughs> well known, that is that the, 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 the relative enthalpy with respect to the stationary state of a Markov chain decreases in time, and that the rate of change is bounded by the Dirichlet form, or maybe you can call it, you want to call it Fisher information, or, or, or something else. Uh, energy, I like to call it energy. Uh, and the, but when it's not invariant, you get something that might be increasing, and it actually has to be increasing at some point because the, the measure mu rho is not the invariant one. And at the end, when t goes to infinity, you converge to the, to the real stationary state, which is not mu rho, and the entropy is, uh, is different from zero. Um, so, well, uh, here, since you are a, have a finite Markov chain, actually this adjoint thing is very easy to compute because you just have a matrix and you have to, uh, to, to compute the, the adjoint. is basically some sort of a, a weighted uh, trans transposition. Hmm? Okay, so, but uh, this is something which is general. It's true for any Markov chain, any measure that you put there. And well, sometimes gives you some in useful information, sometimes not. And the, the name of the game now is to choose as a reference measure something as close as possible to what we believe should be the stationary measure. Okay, so if you succeed in that part, then you may get uh, something which is not very big as uh, the ln star of 1. So, in our case, well, you can go and compute. It's not very difficult because uh, everything is explicit. Uh, this is just a few lines computation. You can compute ln star of 1 is equal to what? The sum over x of phi x. This is uh, easy to understand. The dynamics is translation invariant. So this function is translation invariant, so you should get something translation invariant, so you get this. Um, what is this? It should be something local, because the dynamics is local. And well, I have an expression. Actually, maybe you can write, well, it's equal to that, but you also can write it like this, which is a little bit more natural, because it's actually what uh, pops out from the computations. Doesn't really matter. The point is that this object here is what we call a quadratic function. What does it mean, a quadratic function? Uh, imagine that... Uh, Okay, uh, uh, of course, the, the expectation of this function with respect to the measure mu rho is zero. But imagine that I didn't take the right uh, density. Okay, so I took another density rho prime, which is not rho. And I compute the, the, the expectation of this function with respect to this new product measure, rho prime. If you do that, you will get, uh, well, this is a constant, doesn't matter. You will get the difference rho prime minus rho to the square. So the, the, de the deviation, when you have uh, something which is not ex uh, the, the right uh, uh, density, 
in the expectation of this form uh, of this function here is quadratic and that's the key since it is quadratic this uh, this deviation we can get a, a, a very nice bound on this uh, expectation there if it weren't be quadratic it doesn't work you will only get something like a little o of n as a, as 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 a, as a bound and uh, this is uh, th this fact here that uh, this function is is quadratic in that sense indicates that uh, you are really choosing the right uh, a reference measure on your computation okay and so uh, there is something called uh, let me quote um, Okay, so now let me write a lemma. So this is another thing which is very uh, common uh, among mathematicians. Uh, of course, the other expectation there, I can write it as the integral with respect to uh, ft. Okay, because ft is the distribution of the, uh, is the law of, the, of e e eta t, so I can write it as an integral uh, of that function with respect to ft. The function ft, I don't have a lot of information about it. It's, the, it's, it's basically, if I knew what ft were, uh, I, I, will I will know everything, no? So, you say, okay, let's forget about what ft is, and let's see if we can prove something which is true for any density f. Uh, so, lemma, uh, the lemma is the following. So, this is uh, for any delta bigger than zero, there exists a constant C finite such that for any F, for any density, the following holds. Okay, so you can bound the integral of this sum here with respect to the function f by the Dirichlet form of f times this constant delta and the entropy. So h of f is the entropy, so h of f uh, Okay, so if you assume that the lemma is true, then the theorem is proof huh? Because what happens uh, that, okay, first we choose delta uh, small enough to, to be compensated by the minus c there then you get something of the form ddth smaller than this factor here and now you use uh, well you say for example Gronwald no or, or whatever I mean, even just you can say that the solutions of uh, all these are unique or something then you can get a constant okay do you expect this constant to blow up as you go to infinity or not so it should blow up. So the invariant measure should be really different from the really different from the one because uh, actually, so so the invariant measure. Okay, so <coughs> notice that let's say that b is equal to zero, then for, uh, mu one half is invariant, but it's not only invariant; it's also reversible. Mm -hmm. So you are comparing your non-reversible dynamics with a measure which is reversible with respect to some dynamics which is looks a little looks very close to the, to, to the real one but it's reversible so there will be some observable that takes into account this non-reversibility thing that will tell you no you're not really in the reversible situation 
So this, this, uh, this variable should be the current, okay? Here, uh, okay, here uh, the, the, uh, there are no currents in the spatial sense, no? But uh, you can say, well, you can uh, have another definition of, uh, of current, maybe a heat flow, something like that, because... The current is for the whole dynamic. The whole if, if you look just at h n of t, that gives you the, the distribution of your guy at time t. And this, you expect, will be singular uh, with respect to the Bernoulli product measure at... When t goes to infinity. Because you have this current that is uh, evolving in time and is creating uh, the, no, the, uh, the, the non-reversible features of the, of the model. So, actually, uh, you can use this, uh, this theorem to prove uh, an actual fluctuation theorem, so to prove that uh, convergence to some uh, stochastic PDE. And for those stochastic PDE, you can, uh, you can ask the question, what happens at t equals to infinity? And you start to see the, the non-reversibility issues. So this constant should effectively blow up in t, um, it shouldn't blow up too fast. So we expect it to blow up uh, like uh, polynomial in t. Okay? From the ground wall, you just get uh, exponential, but it should be just polynomial. But it should uh, blow up in t because of non reversibility. Okay? And um, here, if you interpret this system as, um, uh, as some sort of a particle system in contact with some chemical reservoir. You can talk about chemical currents and then everything makes sense and you can say, okay, this, this current there is the one that will detect the non-reversibility of the model. Okay, so, um, well, so far so good. So how much time uh, do I have? Um, about uh, 15 minutes. Okay, so, well, if you accept uh, that this dilemma is true, then uh, the theorem is proved, and uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a very nice result because it's, it's really telling you that uh, um, at least at the, the, at, at the scales on which we are interested in, this non-reversibility of the systems is, uh, is a smooth phenomenon. So you develop these uh, long-range correlations these uh, characteristic features of non-reversible systems in a smooth way when you, when you start from something which uh, is close to the, uh, let's say, uh, equilibrium uh, setting. Uh, so here uh, um, we are trying to show how systems go from uh, this uh, well-known phase to the to, to the more complicated or reversible thing. Okay, um, so let me see if I can actually tell you a little bit about the proof of this lemma. So, um, actually, there is something that I, w I just uh, want to Quote, what what is really going on here is that each time this is a one-dimensional phenomenon. Each time you have a local observable, which is quadratic, in the sense that I described before, of, uh, of a nice uh, interacting particle system you can show that this uh, local observable is very well approximated by the square of the density of particles in a box of macroscopic size. Okay, so this is uh, something that um, something we call uh, the second order Boltzmann gives a principle
which is uh, something uh, we introduced with, uh, with Patricia Gonzalez in the context of uh, the KPZ equation, uh, which tells you What does it tell you this? Uh, okay, it's not the same, but it's close in spirit, and actually, uh, it can be proof uh, that, that the proof is very similar, at least in spirit. Um, it tells you the following. So, this is actually what, uh, the thing that is uh, is uh, is bounded. Let me see if I am missing some constant somewhere. So the variance of this guy. There should be a square root of L here. So this is of order one. Then the variance is rho one minus rho. There is also rho one minus rho. So there is there's probably B o times rho and there is uh, And there is probably here square root of rho one minus rho. Okay, so if you do this, then you can. Uh, this is what is bounded by uh, by this. Okay, so the main uh, the main idea this is something that happens very generally in uh, one-dimensional systems is that uh, when you have a quadratic function in the in the sense uh, in this sense here, for example, then you can approximately very well by the square of the density of particles uh, properly renormalized. Uh, and the cost uh, you pay to do that is the is the is the Dirichlet form. Okay, so this is what we call the the energy estimate uh, in in in, my, in in our work with the with Patricia. And from here you see that we are almost at the at the end of the lemma because once you are here you just need to prove that this part here can be bounded by the by the entropy. And this is just the entropy inequality uh, with the extra element that this guy here is very close to a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so once uh, you have understood that the that this kind of local functions can be approximated by the square of the density of particles, then These kind of uh, results are uh, are, uh, are very reasonable. Okay, so well, this is more or less uh, how you can prove uh, uh, such a theorem, but the, uh, it also hints you at how can you obtain uh, more refined results because. Uh, what uh, actually this the this inequality here is telling you is that uh, you can approximate at the level of the macroscopic evolution 
any local function of your system by a combination of a linear and a quadratic function of the density of particles. And because let's say, imagine that here we have uh, you, we have um, it's not purely quadratic. You, we, we have a, a linear term. Then what happens is that actually the linear term is okay because it's the density of particles. So if you now go back to the beginning and you say, okay, let's try to prove uh, some sort of uh, fluctuation result associated to the hydrodynamic limit, what you need to understand is how the evolution of the density of particles um, behave as the uh, scale of your system goes to infinity. So in principle, since you are talk we are talking about a huge uh, Markov chain, with uh, 2 to the n uh, uh, states, uh, the density of particles, which is uh, uh, roughly speaking, uh, is, is, uh, is order n variables, you know, because uh, you can imagine that we are taking blocks of size 100 to compute uh, some average density, and you just uh, keep track of these uh, numbers there. Uh, will not describe everything, no? Will not describe any observable of your system. But once you understand that uh, you can actually any local observable of your system express it in terms of the density, you can try to obtain a closed equation for the density of particles. Okay? And this closed equation at the level of fluctuations in one in one dimension will involve two elements. The a linear part and a quadratic part, because of the of, of, of these lemmas here. Uh, when you have a linear and a quadratic part, uh, there is a finite set of equations that you can uh, obtain in the limit. Uh, actually, uh, you have basically two possibilities: either the linear heat equation, the stochastic heat equation, or the KPC equation. So. Once uh, you have proof uh, this here and there about the, the entropy, complemented with the, with, with the method of proof, you see that you can actually try to tackle the problem of uh, what happens with the, uh, with the uh, observables of, the, of your Markov chain, macroscopic observables of relevance of your Markov chain in the limit when the uh, system goes to infinity. Okay, well, I think uh, uh, I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Any question? Can, can you extract some result on the fluctuating hydrodynamics uh, once now you control quite well? Uh, so, a priori, uh, well, that depends on uh, uh, the level of rigorosity you want, uh, because uh, and that depends on the level uh, of um, of faith you have in tightness. Okay, so let's say that you can prove uh, tightness in some nice uh, topo topology that is enough for your process, so uh, uh, it's good enough. Then in that case, what you will prove for this system, for example, is that. Uh, um, when you do the, the natural scaling of the density of particles, so you take uh, something like uh, uh, you define some field uh, xtn, so you have to use test functions because uh, at the level of fluctuations, this guy has the bad taste of uh, being uh, distributions. No, so well, th this is what it is. You have to do it uh, like that. You use some test function, and you you will get that uh, in the limit, this field here will be solution of this equation here. So in general, uh, well, well, let's write this, this the, the case that I discussing here. And then there will be some noise. 
So this is a white noise. Uh, this part of the noise comes from the from the exclusion part. So okay, so that here there will be some square root of rho y minus rho. And then there is a second noise coming from the from the creation and annihilation, which has a uh, uh, on front of it g of rho the two dot line where this g of rho is uh, is is, uh, is uh, you put some here okay so well some function it, it, it's some constant that uh, is related to the rates of creation and annihilation so this is what you can prove for this particular system okay so this, for this particular system you can prove that the fluctuations evolve in this way Notice that here you have this number, f prime of rho. So f prime of rho can either be positive or negative. If it's at, at that at this scale, it doesn't matter because this equation is well posed for any time t. But when you send t to infinity, this equation will converge to a uh, to an equilibrium measure if and only if f prime is uh, non-positive. If f prime is positive, this will start to blow up uh, exponentially in time. Okay. In that sense, you can see that uh, you cannot do better than that. On the other hand, when the when f prime is negative, you expect to be able to prove that the that the constant doesn't blow up uh, too fast. In, so it depends on the situation, okay? And, and somehow the, the entropy bound has to be sensitive to what happens when t is big. Because it's something that depends on the whole distribution of the, of the Markov chain. Thank you.